Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, in primer lugar, uh, me gustaría aprovechar esta oportunidad para agradecer a las barceloneses por su hospitalidad. Su soledad es realmente sorprendente. Espero me disculpen por no decir esto en catalán. Muchas gracias. Hello. Hello, my name is Andrew Bogue. I'm here to talk to you about um, clustered file systems in your application stack. So, um, moving right along. I want to start the discussion, I want to start this presentation with a definition of a complex problem. There's a couple of different sort of flavors of this definition, but I heard it and I cannot actually remember where I heard it, but I really like it and it's very applicable in the IT space of a complex problem is one that when we start thinking about solutions as technical people and we propose those solutions, what we end up doing is changing the problem. And the problem in the, in the case of a clustered file system or a distributed file system is that, well, one of the problems is that there can be some new and unexpected behaviors when you move from a single traditional file system that was sitting one cable away from your CPU in a standard server to one that is distributed or networked. So just a bit about Catalyst to give you some context. So we're all about open source technology. Um, these are some of the uh, systems that we work with, some of the technologies we work with. We have uh, offices, uh, our headquarters is in Wellington in New Zealand. I'm a New Zealander. Um, we have also in Australia, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane and a UK office in Brighton. We have our own OpenStack cloud, public cloud in Wellington, New Zealand, actually with a number of availability zones, sorry, regions. And that's been going since 2014, There's a public cloud. This was the first public cloud in New Zealand. We're all about open source technologies and that sort of open source focus took us to OpenStack. So just want to give everyone a heads up and give you a rip cord uh, to let you know what this, call, call, what this talk is all about because there's a lot of great talks going on. So this, this talk is very much aimed at OpenStack users, at solutions architects, at people who are deploying solutions into an OpenStack cloud. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of the stories and experiences that we've had um, and, and some of the things that we've seen and, and you know, what we've done and, and this includes both legacy and other cloud uh, platforms because it's reasonably agnostic. This is a Linux centric talk. We don't do Windows stuff at all. Uh, I'll spend a bit of time talking about GlusterFS because I think that's quite an interesting uh, technology at the moment. We seem to get a lot of interest around it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention the Manila project. That's not what this is about at all. And I will get onto object storage because object storage is relevant uh, in terms of the clustered file system problem. So let's just take a step back in time, right? The file system. The file system 101. Once upon a time, and this is still very much the case for you know, many computers that are turned on, including the phone that was in your pocket, you know, they had a CPU, they had RAM, had a file system. Right? And these were all sort of proverbially uh, one cord away from each other, one cable away from each other, and there were, sort of, there were quite a few assumptions that came with that around things like availability, consistency, performance. Right? You know, they sort of were quite predictable, and consistency is probably the one that, for me personally, takes the most mindset adjustment when you move away from like a singular file system to one that's networked or distributed is that the idea that once you make a write or an update that that will be that will be consistent and perpetual and you won't get any ambiguous answers but I mean as as we've noticed this these sort of ideas and this belief of what a file system is has really influenced some of the challenges we've faced when we've moved application stacks into a networked or distributed file system model so we moved from the more traditional one single file system into a network file system. Now, when I say network file system, I don't mean specifically NFS, but obviously NFS is going to be discussed, but just a file system that is a network away from your application or web server. One that is available to multiple compute um, instances and is something that everyone has had some exposure to, whether you're a developer or someone working in an office, when you use the, the bottomless X drive inside your office that was the big shared pile of mess. And that's, these, these also have their challenges. Um, as we've discovered, uh, they, they're big, they get full of clutter, they have some performance challenges, they, need, uh, they, get, full, they get filled up quite quickly, um, they have a certain amount of overhead from operationals around managing capacity and quotering and all these sorts of things. So they, 
they sort of solved some problems in the terms of capacity and availability, but very much brought some new challenges to the table. So, you know, one day, of course, we all had our first bad experience with a clustered file system, with a, with a shared file system. You know, maybe it was that X drive, and that means, you know, it broke, or um, there, was, it, there was massive performance degradation because of, you know, locking or race condition issues, or it was just unreliable and there was never any space on it, or we weren't able to write things fast enough to it. So there were challenges that everyone's seen, including it simply not being available. So now I'm going to talk, just go through some of the te technical approaches we've used to solve the challenge of having file storage available to our application, web servers, whatever you want to call it. So NFS, of course. NFS, the workhorse, working hard since 1984. Thanks very much, Solaris, and everyone who's contributed to NFS since then. Bit of a pop quiz. Who is using some form of NFS right now? Lots of hands, of course, right. Who's using a replicated NFS solution? Okay. Who's, who has what they consider to be a rock solid, high availability, automatically failing over NFS solution? Please come and talk to me afterwards. That's, uh, that's great. So it's, it's, and we're still using it very much so. It's a, it's a great technology. It's very, the thing, I, the, thing, the thing that I come back to, and I'm not a network engineer or a sysadmin, I'm sort of an amateur generalist who has to sort of get involved in decision making. Some of the things I ask my sysadmins and network architects to do, they look at me and say, you, you can't do that, and, but I'm sort of just being pragmatic and I want to get things done. The thing that I've, I like the most about NFS, or one of its really strong qualities, is we know it well. Okay, so any sysadmin who's been around for a while really does understand some of the symptoms, what some of the symptoms of a poorly performing NFS system actually mean, right? They, they understand potentially what happens when you try and use locking aggressively or if it's just not working properly or if there are disc under underlying disk issues. And that's a very good thing because when the gloves come off and there are problems, you have people who have pragmatic solutions as to how to fix it. Now, in the real world, when things go wrong, as they do, that's infinitely valuable. And that's, what some of the, that's actually some of the issues that I'll talk about later with some of the different technologies where we weren't in the best position to really diagnose and resolve some of these, these problems. So the next one um, is, as I said, we've got a lot of NFS stuff going on, which is you know, no great surprise to anyone. DRBD, once again, who's using DRBD in some way, shape, or form? Okay. So we, so DRB, DR, DRBD is, you know, block level rate over Ethernet, essentially, okay? So when we saw this for the first time, oops, when we saw this for the first time probably about eight years ago, to us it really solved a lot of problems. Um, and this is, we used this prior to when we went on to cloud infrastructure for replication of file systems. Uh, to us it really solved, sorry, it really solved the replication problem because it was agnostic in re replicating anything uh, and that gave us a lot of power to be able to just have an agnostic replication solution where we were very confident that the, the data in one place was getting replicated to another. We, uh, we did some quite interesting, it wasn't our initiative, we, we saw it in the market, we did some great solutions with um, Postgres replication and using this as a way of having zero data loss in a replicated Postgres setup. We had a lot to do with Postgres you know, 10 years ago where there were about four different ways of doing replication, master-slave replication, uh, all having sort of certain levels of trade-off. And the DRBD model, um, I actually was present during a, a demonstration where someone had set up two physical machines uh, as a master secondary DRBD setup, and they were writing just an, an, an incremental insert into the database on the master, and then someone went and pulled the plug out of the master, and you could see the last value that had been inserted into the database, and then they went and fired up the secondary one and fired up the database, which was not, which is not available until you do a failover, but they'd fired that one up and you could see that the very last data point had made it all the way to the, all the, way to the secondary server, which was quite an interesting um, sort of functionality because the other replication strategies didn't guarantee that. I mean, most of the time the latency and lag would be very small, but it was not guaranteed always going to work. Now we had one other interesting experience with DRBD where um, we ran an entire Zen image on actually a DRBD replicated server so that in the instance of a failure, the entire Zen image sort of popped up on the other side of the pair. This was our sort of early attempts at a high availability VM. Now of course it was brilliantly genius and to all of us at the beginning we thought it was um, what a great idea. 
uh, and it did solve us a lot of problems. We didn't have to do any application level replication. All of the configuration of the server was exactly the same. It looked exactly the same once it had moved from one to the other. All the VPNs, everything worked. But we had a sort of a horrible, frightening moment where, for some reason, the DRB re replication had jammed. Because we never actually knew whether it was running on the primary or the secondary. When they actually failed over, all it looked like to us was a reboot. And at the time when it failed over, the DRB replication had actually jammed three months prior. So what happened was, at some random time of the evening, uh, we started getting all these alerts. And the alerts were sort of random, strange alerts. It wasn't that the system was broken. It was just certain characteristics that started firing on our Nagios. And, it, and what we discovered was these are the alerts that we had added over the last several months, because they were not actually on the server anymore. So the whole thing had been wound back three months. Now, hallelujah, uh, actually this particular system was a pre-production solution where the client had actually been dragging their feet to roll it out. So we had backups and we were able to recover. But that put a pretty horrible taste in our mouth around DRBD. And, and unless things have updated recently, the challenge with the secondary node in some DRBD setups is it's a bit of a black box and you don't necessarily know what the state is until you actually enable it. And you can sort of ask DRBD, are you okay? But asking an application if it's okay is not the same as actually having some external test that does validate the state. So there's a little bit of caution that snuck into our world after that, but however, we are still using it. And the fact that it's agnostic to what you store in it makes it an extremely powerful solution. So OS, OCFS2, has anyone ever used OCFS2? Wow, okay, so we saw that um, as an Oracle clustered file system, this would be six or seven years ago, we saw this and thought, wow, holy grail, this is what we want. This is sort of a lot of the things that Gluster offers. And we installed this. Um, we did not do enough testing. Um, we did not do enough profiling. And on one happy day, it all just came crumbling down. Uh, there was, this was using physical machines at the time. This is before there was even AWS in Australia. So we ended up in a situation where we just basically had a broken file system and, and DR in itself was not, uh, we didn't have a DR model that involved leaving this technology. So we sort of ran away from this. I had a, uh, I did actually look recently to see if there was anyone still using this um, and it, I didn't see terribly much interesting, but we experimented it. It looked very, very promising. It was a multi-master um, file storage setup, uh, but yeah, we would not go anywhere near it again. So Gluster FS, okay, Gluster is something that we came to in 2012. Um, the, the background being that it was our first, we were, we were engaged, and this, this, is a, this, was, this was using AWS, but the information here is agnostic to any platform because there was nothing here that you couldn't do it anything on, even Azure. Um, so we were brought here because we proposed a solution for a large LMS stack. It was a MOOC for an Australian uh, university. And this, was a, this is a big platform, gets over a million page views a day, uh, has lots going on, sort of quite a standard LAMP sort of a stack using Postgres, not MySQL, but same sort of stuff, um, using all the sort of scale, horizontal scaling techniques you would imagine. And in our, in our solution, we had NFS. We, we decided we wanted to do some sort of high availability NFS solution. And that was given a lot of criticism uh, by a number of solution architects who sort of said that doesn't adhere to the um, architect for failure model and you need to go and start using GlusterFS. So you know, that, that was where we began, um, and this was 2012. And since then, we've actually, and we, we are still using it uh, in this particular platform, um, and it's been clear to us that there's interest in the GlusterFS space. As there was a blog post written on our website, on the Catalyst website, just about some of the technical tools we use and some of the, the ways we apply things. And it was really just about our GlusterFS story and we just talked about what we'd used it for and what we'd seen and what were some of the problems we'd, we'd faced and you know, when we thought it was suitable. And that got a lot of traffic. And we were actually contacted on LinkedIn and a few other people by people saying, we're thinking about using Gluster, what do you think? Um, and you know, what, what we would say is that it's, it's different and you need, to, you need to think about how you're gonna use it and you know, we're happy to have a discussion and, and some of that would, sort of went forward into engagements of work. So something to understand now, the Gluster FS is, um, something we've used in, in certain ways, and there are, there are other ways of using Gluster that, that we are not using. But so our, some, some things to understand is your application server, your web server, if you're talking about a standard web application, it needs to have a client library to actually mount the storage. Right now, 
sometimes you see that Gluster is NFS compatible, but you're not using NFS. If you're using NFS, you're not getting the, the redundancy advantages of Gluster. So your application needs to have its own library. Now, and your, your application servers also understand that there is more than one Gluster storage node. So in the same way that DNS knows that there's more, DN more than one DNS server or you know, mail supports the idea that you don't have to actually do a failover, it understands that there is another server it can go and talk to. So the failover happens conceivably at the actual app level. Once again, it depends on how you might have set up your underlying cluster, underlying cluster but if you have a small number of redundant um, cluster nodes, then you, uh, your replication will fail over if you sort of proverbially pull the plug out of it. I mean, there's some configuration about how long you let it time out and stuff like that. The storage nodes behind the scene are also doing some syncing. They are talking to each other and um, replicating between themselves, uh, auto-healing. The one thing that got us in when, when, we, when we have had issues with Gluster is that the files themselves are only visible by mounting the, the Gluster mount. So in the case where you had some NFS problem, for example, and you decided that, oh, look, it's all gone horribly wrong and we're getting slow performance, but we really need to get this file off because we just need this file, you can just SSH into the machine, go and get the file and pull it off, right? Whereas with Gluster, that's not always possible because the files themselves are, repl are, are sort of represented as, as metadata and sort of pieces. So generally the way you get things off is by mounting the Gluster itself, which if Gluster isn't working very well is quite problematic. And of course there's a number of different considerations around RAID setups and architectures and, and, and all the trade-offs you can have around performance, redundancy and, and flexibility. So ClusterFS could be for you for, for these sorts of reasons. Um, it's just not feasible to, to move away from a file storage layer. Um, you have to use a file storage layer. That's, that's what you have to do but you don't want to use NFS. Another thing is if you have a good understanding of the usage pattern of your files, what it's actually doing, right? Because that, that sort of matters. What sort of files are it, is it putting on there? How many times is it checking for a file that never changes? Is it trying to use locking, is it using little session files to, to store some data? Are they changing or are they, are they small or are they large? Um, and of course following on to are you able to actually configure or patch your application to do some things that make it a little bit more sensible to use Gluster. One of the um, la larger mutable file objects, like the sorts of things you put in object storage, are actually a, a reasonably good use case for Gluster. One of the problems that we faced was our application, the same application, the uh, large Moodle LMS, was using, a, it was using a session file that stored user data, and that was written, there's a couple of places you can put it, but you can put it in the database, you can put it in a caching server, or you can put it on the file system. Now it's just a small file that stores some information, but if it's running on a single machine, it's getting updated and read all the time on disk, and that works just fine. But when it was put onto Gluster, that didn't work very well at all. I mean, and it only really manifested itself under certain load conditions. If, if there wasn't a lot happening, it sort of worked reasonably well, but if once things started going badly, they started going very badly. Um, so that was something that we discovered and it was particularly visible when in Gluster as opposed to other, other solutions. So some ideas about when Gluster might not be right for you is if you don't understand what your application is really doing. If you're taking some proprietary lift and shift exercise where you're moving something into the cloud and you decide you need a clustered file system, you go, we'll just use Gluster, be careful because you don't really know unless you know what's actually, what's actually happening, and there are ways to profile these things, there is a risk that it will do things that doesn't suit Cluster very well. Um, once again, if you're not able to actually make changes to this application, then that limits your ability to fix any issues that may arise. Um, certainly small, highly accessed and mutable files are ones that you want to be careful with. It's not to say that it can't be done, but it's one to be careful of. And of course, the lack of internal expertise. If you don't have the people or the support or the agreements or partners to be able to work through any challenges, then once again, be careful. So what does a sad GlusterFS look like? Now, I'm not saying don't use Gluster at all. Uh, I'm just passing on our stories of what it looks like when it's in an unhappy state. So of course, you can get, and we have certainly seen this. Um, this has been problems that we've faced. Uh, for a number of reasons. One of the cases actually a few years ago was nothing to do with Gluster. It was actually a kernel bug where because there'd been so many nodes created, the, the, um, this is beyond my knowledge of how the internet 
tracking, routing works, but there was something being cached that meant that basically network wasn't working between the machines. But this broke uh, Gluster grandiosely, and to us this was a failure of Gluster. Uh, so we saw massive performance degradation and just complete failure to be able to the application to work. Uh, you may get timeouts, um, file, uh, file operation failures, split brain scenario, um, which is pretty frightening. Um, clustered failure, meaning you know one part your file system fails, that would, which is shared across potentially a number of applications, and it fails for one and it fails for all. And of course, application outage. So these sorts of things are very bad. So taking that on board and thinking about what are the mistakes that we have seen um, and made uh, in our cluster implementation journey is not enough performance and usage profiling. Right, and this, this, is, this also goes to the thinking about this as a new model, not just the same as you know, the RAIDs and the file storage models that were built before. Of like, there was quite a standard way of testing that. You know, people were very interested in things like IOPS and throughput and availability and, and how you might tune the RAID setups and all that sort of stuff. And that's still important, but you have to think about actually really understanding the usage and how, it's, how your application is talking to the file system. Load testing, of course. Load testing for us, um, interesting uh, scenario where Apache, so we had a site data, pretty standard web application, so there was a site data that was visible to Apache, and Apache by default was looking every time it looked inside a, served a, a folder that was on the site data component, not with the applications, it was looking for the small .ht access file. Right? Even though we never use that particular, te we never do HT access in that way, we had a centralized configuration, but by default it was still actually looking to see if one existed. Now that put a huge, huge, o that gave massive performance degradation and once we actually reconfigured Apache to not do that anymore, we got about 10 times more throughput. So, but that was once again something we weren't expecting. This, the, the other implementation mistake, I talk about this file system assumptions problem of just assuming but that because it looks like a file system and behaves like a file system, then it's a file system, the same as the one you've always used. But you've, that, that assumption is, is dangerous. Another thing potentially is getting too distracted by some of the traditional exercises of file system and, and storage uh, sort of measuring, which is all you know, really getting distracted with what sort of RAID setups you want and how much IOPS you need and all that. because those are solvable problems in other ways, right? If you talk about cloud native applications, there are other ways to get faster throughput. There are other tools you can use. It isn't the same as in the past where it was all about the fastest point to write persistent storage was the centralized disk. There are other ways that still adhere to high availability and no single point of failure, even in memory ones that if you're comfortable with and you've, and you've set up properly are still valid. And there's more and more ways in which, so we tend to, when we use storage nodes and cloud infrastructure, just use a single, uh, single disk or a single block device because there's already redundancy under the hood and there's, there's redundancy built across the number, number of nodes. But sometimes, <coughs> because of the legacy of the way we did this in the past, we spend a lot of time really faffing around with all sorts of you know, RAID setups and all that. And it just, I don't necessarily think it was always terribly valuable. Backup and monitoring with the instance of Gluster is also different. Uh, you need to have a think about how you're going to do it. It isn't snapshotting uh, block devices uh, is something that is a good way of just getting started but isn't always perfect and can end up causing you to pay quite a lot of money for a lot of snapshots. Um, e even if you have one that does only incremental, even if you have a solution that only charges you for the incremental difference, if you start doing it lots and lots and lots, you still find yourself really storing a lot of things that you probably don't really need to store and that just means you spend more. And isn't always, um, and monitoring as well. Monitoring, you always need to spend more time on getting your monitoring tidy and getting it slick. Review, review, retro, talk, talk about problems, get in a room, discuss what your challenges are, see if you can improve it, experiment. I mean, this is the great thing about a cloud infrastructure is that you can prototype and you can stand off, you can have an orchestrated stack and fire it up and run load testing and all these things that was a lot more challenging traditionally with physical machines because you, you only had a, symbol, a, a, a small amount of them and they weren't, they weren't sort of lying around for your use. So now I do sort of come on to just mentioning objects. And I, this CAP theorem, I just think is genius. When I first saw the CAP theorem, and it's relevant for file storage and databases and, and everything that is based on the single point of truth, is really understanding what your storage needs can tolerate. 
Because, I mean, really, as much as this is about clustered file systems in the, in the title, you want to be starting to think always about how you can move to objects. And I, I mean, I don't have time to talk about a large reason of why objects are great or what are the advantages of them, but they, ha they have many advantages in terms of management and overhead and capacity and all those things. But they, they don't map one to one with the use pattern of, uh, of an application that's expecting a file system. And it's not always easy. But if it's really, I find it really useful just to think about which one of those three things you can sacrifice. So you've got consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Tr traditionally, file systems don't do the partition tolerance terribly well, but they are consistent and they are available. Whereas object storage, you, s you have tolerance to partitions and availability, but the answer isn't always consistent. Now, that, that, that's fine if your application understands that. And certainly, more and more, we see the future of our cloud-native applications as being using objects, and we're already starting to do that. But there are challenges, and it's quite a journey, especially if something was built, wasn't built for that. And in our opinion, some of the object implementation challenges that you will face if you're taking an application and moving it into object storage from uh, network storage, using the APIs, right? You're still going to have to go through this application and find all the places where it's writing things, even where it has a file system layer, and implement the API use. The whole eventual consistency just makes my brain hurt. It shouldn't be like that. You wrote something, you should get it back. And you will most of the time, but your application has to not be confused when it doesn't get the same answer back, right? And things like large objects, for example, the risk, once, once objects start getting larger, the risk of getting in, inconsistent um, answers is very low, but still um, it will be very bad if these things happen. Like, for example, with the, with the session um, example I gave earlier, where data was being stored inside a session, that would not be suitable for objects because you would get inconsistent answers and you might get different answers at different times and the, and the latency of adding these things is generally too high. Immutable objects, objects can't change. You have to create them and delete them. There's access latency. Sometimes it's not that fast to push in and out objects compared to writing to a file system. And the other one is once you decide what is a good use of object storage, understanding what you're going to do with the pieces of your file system uh, sort of workload that don't fit that model. Which other tools are you going to use? Are you going to use Redis? Are you going to use a queue? Are you going to use some in-memory storage? Really understanding what your options are and what's a good idea and how that needs to be architected. And that's very much not a solved problem. But there are so many tools in the open source space that really allow you to do amazing things. The last one is just that legacy file system addiction that we're just stuck on it and it's the way it should be and like that, that's, what, that's where we want to be. So this is the, this is the poorly worded um, cloud native application oath, you know, my cloud native application does not need a file system for persistent storage. Well, of course, many of the ones that still run on our workloads do, but moving forward, uh, there are just so many advantages to objects in terms of the, I mean, in terms of the underlying infrastructure, if you're actually running an open state cloud yourself, I mean, Swift just makes so much more sense as opposed to big disks. Um, your capacity management, the way you actually have to care about the assets in there and your ability to roll things over, the way you do backups, everything. It makes a lot of sense, but is a bit of a radical leap. One more thing, actually, that I've actually got a few minutes left, so I'll mention, is that technically, um, does anyone still use blobs, database blobs, in their application? Okay, so not many. Because once upon a time, of course, especially in the Oracle world, um, storing files was very much about using the blob layer, so putting these binary objects into the database, which was essentially a network file system in the sense that it was available from a lot of places, and you, you, know, you had this centralized point of storage, um, but it had all sorts of problems. I mean, every time I, every time I tried to use blobs, it just wasn't a very elegant way of doing it. So um, I've actually finished early, which is good. I hope I might be able to take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions? So Ceph, I did not mention, so we have not used CephFS. We're aware of it. Um, we're using Ceph as a storage layer in our OpenStack cloud to provide elastic block services. We have not used CephFS. We would like to have a look at it. I'm very interested in having a look at it, but we haven't rolled it out yet. Okay, muchas gracias. <laughs>